You're watching a video showing the periodic inflation of pig lungs through a hose connected to the trachea. Hypnotic, mesmerizing, and it does a really good job of driving home the dynamic nature of lung tissue. The function of our lungs in exchanging gases between air and blood is a pretty standard concept that you were probably first taught back in grade school. In this video, we'll take it several steps further as we look at the detailed anatomy of the human lung. Welcome back to our continuing discussion of the thoracic cavity. We just finished up discussing the pleural cavity and now move our focus to the lungs which are surrounded by this potential space. Our objectives for this session. First, we'll look at the various lobes and fissures associated with each lung and their position relative to the thoracic wall. We will also look at the blood supply of the lung, differentiating between systemic and pulmonary circulation to the lungs. We will also look at innervation to the lung, lymphatic drainage of the interstitium, and discuss the relevance of these topics related to a number of clinical scenarios. As you saw in the opening video segment, the lungs are highly elastic structures which can expand when pulled upon by the diaphragm and thoracic cavity, then recoil naturally when these inspiratory muscles relax. But in the anatomy lab, remember, we are working with fixated tissues. This means that the lungs lose their elasticity and maintain the shape of the thoracic cavity after they are removed. It's often possible to see ridges representing uh, alternating ribs and intercostal spaces. We can also see the impressions left by structures such as the vena cava and esophagus on the right lung and the arch of the aorta on the left. In looking at the overall shape of the lungs, we notice that they are concave along the mediastinal and diaphragmatic surfaces and convex along the thoracic surface. The most prominent surface structure is the hilum, which surrounds the root of the lung along the mediastinal surface. Now this serves as an access point for structures entering and exiting the lungs. Identifying the specific structures can be a little tricky, especially if the root is transected close to the lung after the primary structures begin to branch. Typically, the pulmonary artery is found most superiorly it's unique among arteries in that it carries a deoxygenated blood towards the lung for gas exchange. The walls are smooth and when compared to the pulmonary veins located more anteriorly within the root, they tend to have a slightly thicker wall. Posteriorly in the root is the primary bronchus, which serves as the conduit for atmospheric air passing into and out of the lung. This wall is the thickest to be found in the root, and it's characterized by the presence of cartilage to maintain the airway lumen. A number of smaller structures pass through the root of the lung, including nerves and lymphatics. Of particular note are the bronchial arteries and veins, which are found just posterior to the primary bronchi. They're rather small and not originally even pictured here, so let's draw them in. It may seem ironic, but despite the volume of air that passes through the lungs with each breath, there are parts of the lung that do not receive sufficient oxygen to serve its needs. The bronchial arteries branch off the thoracic aorta to provide this oxygen supply to the lung structures, with blood returning to the azagous vein through the bronchial veins. One of the main concepts related to the lungs is segmentation. You have these major primary vessels and conduit air channels that split into secondary segments, then tertiary, and on and on until we end up with microscopic respiratory segments that maximize surface area at the blood-gas interface. Just take a quick second to reinforce this point. These terminal structures are considered the respiratory portion of the circuit because this is where gas exchange is allowed to occur. All points proximal to this region can collectively be referred to as the conductive segment of the respiratory tract. It's difficult to trace structures to these terminal points at a gross macroscopic level, but we can look at the secondary and tertiary bronchiopulmonary segments of organization. The secondary level is also referred to as the lobar division. Within each lung, there are fissures that functionally divide the lung into specified lobes with each being supplied by a distinct secondary lobar segment. There are two lobar segments present in the left lung, 
with the oblique fissure dividing the lung into superior and inferior lobes. In the right lung, an oblique fissure also distinguishes the inferior lobe. However, a transverse fissure further distinguishes an additional middle lobe from the superior lobe above. The secondary lobar segments will further subdivide into tertiary bronchiopulmonary segments. In the left lung, there are four each in the superior and inferior lobes. On the right side, we define three segments in the superior lobe, two in the middle, and five in the inferior lobe. The segments within a given lobe remain functionally separated from one another through connective tissue barriers. This has implications in clinical practice. First, mild diseases within a given segment typically remain compartmentalized rather than spreading between different segments. That helps minimize the severity of the illness. These defined boundaries also mean that diseased bronchiopulmonary segments may be surgically resected from a lobe without disrupting healthy lung tissue. Bronchiopulmonary segments will continue to divide into a couple dozen lobules, with each containing a terminal bronchiole and associated pulmonary vessels, which are separated from one another by a fibrous septum. Each terminal bronchiole then gives rise to a couple dozen respiratory bronchioles, with each terminating in a cluster of alveoli called an asinus. In a healthy adult lung, approximately 300 million alveoli are available for gas exchange. At this level, the pulmonary vessels have also divided to the point that they form a dense capillary network that surrounds each of the alveolar sacs, creating the blood-gas interface where gas exchange occurs. Pulmonary arterioles travel in close contact with the bronchial tree, dividing into a dense capillary network that completely envelops the alveoli to maximize gas exchange. The oxygen-rich blood then collects into venules that run in the interlobular septa, ultimately fusing to form the pulmonary veins that return blood back to the heart. Let's pause for a moment to discuss lower respiratory tract infections. This is a term used to describe an infection of the airway passages of the trachea or structures distal to this point. The term upper respiratory tract infection is restricted to the larynx and more proximal structures. The most common lower tract infection is bronchitis, which affects the conductive segments of the respiratory tract. Although a number of causative agents have been identified, over 90% of all cases can be attributed to viral infections. Bronchitis is characterized by a productive cough that produces green or yellow sputum which is the body's way of protecting the lower portions of the respiratory tract by clearing out infectious agents through mucus secretions. While a low-grade fever may accompany bronchitis, it's an inconsistent finding. Acute bronchitis will typically resolve within a few weeks, but it can progress and become chronic bronchitis, which is defined as lasting for more than three months and occurring in at least two separate years. By far, the biggest contributing factor to developing chronic bronchitis is cigarette smoking, which increases the rate of mucus production and slows the rate of ciliary movement to clear out the airway. Another common type of infection is pneumonia. Now, in a healthy individual, the immune system neutralizes airway pathogens and the mucus secretions clear debris from the respiratory tract. If either of these processes are compromised, an infection of the conductive bronchial tubes may progress to the respiratory bronchioles and alveoli, resulting in pneumonia. Now, this is a much more serious condition because the thickening of the alveolar wall through inflammation and accumulation of fluid in the sacs compromises gas exchange. As you might expect, populations with weaker immune systems, such as the very young and very old, are at an increased risk for developing pneumonia. And again, smokers are at a higher risk because of overly poor respiratory health. In addition to the cough seen with bronchitis, fever and chills are common with pneumonia. The inflammation will also lead to increased capillary permeability and pleural edema. As described in the previous section, this can result in pleural effusions that may be visible on radiographs. As in many other regions of the body, lymphatic drainage is critical for normal lung function. The numerous lymph nodes surrounding the lung are critical in detecting inspired pathogens and initiating an immune response. There are two major intrapulmonary lymph plexuses within the lung. 
First is the deep plexus. This lines the branches off the bronchial tree and drains the lobules. The second, not clearly shown in this image, is the superficial plexus, which lies just beneath the visceral pleura, draining the tissue just deep to this membrane. These two divisions come together at the hilum, where they drain into the bronchial pulmonary lymph nodes. From here, the lymph will continue into the tracheobronchial nodes surrounding the primary bronchi and continuing up on either side of the trachea. From here, they can either drain into the principal lymphatic and thoracic ducts, or more commonly, into the subclavian veins directly. In addition to filtering lymph for potential pathogens, cancerous cells originating from tumors within the lung will commonly metastasize to the tracheobronchial lymph nodes. Enlargement of these nodes can impinge on the trachea and primary bronchi. This can be observed through either a bronchoscope or through MRI imaging to assist with the diagnosis. The final entity to discuss is the nerve supply to the lungs. And these are derived from the pulmonary plexus that enters the hilus of the lung posteriorly. This nerve plexus is a convergence of sympathetic fibers branching from the sympathetic chain, parasympathetics from the vagus nerve, and visceral afferents that branch from the intercostal nerves to detect pain within the lung tissue. We'll finish off with a look at the surface anatomy for the lungs. Well, okay, not the actual surface anatomy of the lungs. If you could see the lungs from the surface, well, you got serious problems on your hands. But what you can see, or at least palpate, are rib segments along the anterolateral thoracic wall, and these can serve as signpost markers for specific regions of the lung underneath. Specifically, we'll look at the pleural recesses. Remember from the previous section, these are regions where the pleural cavity extends beyond the lungs, especially after you exhale, to create fluid-filled spaces. Well, it turns out that these recesses and other structures prefer the even-numbered ribs, creating what is known as the rule of twos. Let me demonstrate here. The apical portion of the lung projects superiorly, as we've already said. Moving inferiorly, the base widens to reach the sternum at rib two. On the left side, the costomediastinal recess can be found between ribs four and six. Now for the costodiaphragmatic recess. As we move from anterior to posterior, the pleural cavity extends more inferiorly. Anteriorly, it extends as far down as rib eight, laterally as far down as rib 10, and posteriorly, rib 12, eight, 10, 12. See what I mean about these rules of twos? But we're not done yet. Let's look at the inferior most projection of the lung. Anteriorly, it extends as far as rib six, laterally as far down as rib eight, and posteriorly, you probably already guessed it, rib 10. So from anterior to posterior, the costodiaphragmatic recess is, well, essentially two rib segments wide. The rule of twos has major implications related to thoracentesis and chest tube insertions. Thoracentesis involves the removal of air or fluid from the pleural space through needle aspiration. This is typically done for fluid analysis of pleural effusions, which assists in making a number of diagnoses. It can also be therapeutic, alleviating partially collapsed lung segments. Typically, the needle is inserted along the midscapular line between ribs 10 and 12, where the costodiaphragmatic recess is located. For larger amounts of fluid, or for unresolved situations, greater volumes of fluid can be removed over a longer period of time with the placement of a chest tube. Because it'll be left in place for a while, the mid-axillary line is typically targeted so that the patient may lie down without compressing the tube. It's also an alternate choice for thoracentesis depending on the physician's preference or if the mid-scapular line is not accessible in an unconscious patient. In the case of the mid-axillary line placement, the rule of twos tells us the physician will target the space between ribs eight and 10. That will wrap up our discussion of the pleural cavity and lungs. Next on the agenda, we'll explore the space between the pleural cavities called the mediastinum and pay particular attention to the major organ we see there, the human heart. Until that time, this has been Dr. Stuart Ingalls. Enjoy the rest of your day.